and join us in this morning's uh, song celebration, hymn number 117, O oh God, our help in ages past. And we will sing verses 1. You can also go online, which is fumctarrell.org, 
and you can scroll uh, down to the lower right hand corner is a big red donate button it's kind of like staples you know big red donate button that's there you can click on that it'll take you to a page to work on that the third way is just come by the church we're open monday through thursday glad to, to receive your your offerings and tithes at that point here now the 23rd psalm as we prepare our hearts for worship the lord is my shepherd i shall not want he makes me to lie down in green pastures he leads me beside the still waters he restores my soul he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake yea though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear no evil for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies you anoint my head with oil my cup overflows surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and i will dwell in the house of the lord forever it's now time for our, our pastoral prayer and we want to uh, call your attention to the joys and concerns that in the bulletin that you may have received an email on i want to just share some things that are, that are not in there and that is uh the, the one i really want to bring out is that Joyce Lewis is now back in ICU. She's had a setback, and she's in the hospital. I just would uh, covet your prayers for Joyce right now to, to really connect uh, our, our hearts with her and with God and pray for a, a, a healing, an opportunity for her to, to move out of the ICU, back into rehab where she was. But we've looked up David as well during this time. Uh, also, I had a call from Florida this morning, uh, Michelle Rayleigh. Uh, Whose, whose husband Bill Henderson is in the hospital in Florida. So be with Michelle and Bill. And maybe go to God in prayer now. Loving Lord, as we still our hearts, we tune in to you. We hear the voice of you calling for us to be still and know that you are God. And Lord, we do give thanks for the the good things taking place. I give thanks for the 50th anniversary of Nancy and Patrick Harpreeder. Dear God, that they, they repeated their vows last night and committed anew to you and to each other. And I thank you for that. And Lord, I, I pray for I pray for these two we mentioned right now that are that are in the hospital, for Joyce Lewis, as well as for Bill Henderson, that you would be with them both and their families. And Lord, I pray for I pray for the family of Joel Rush, who passed away this week. I pray for his his wife Connie and others. I pray for leaders working together right now. Lord, we know there are people who are hurting right now because of the COVID virus, because of the economy, because of the civil unrest and the need to be heard. Lord, I, I pray that we can connect with you, connect with each other, to see each person, particularly those who are hurting right now, as a child of God, worthy. And Lord, I want to specifically lift up those in the black community that have felt ignored. Lord, I want to pray right now and, and call our leaders to, to pay attention to the needs, particularly the black community, in light of the killing of George Floyd. Of Omar Marbury. And even of the slain seven years ago, close to Terrell, the historically black community of Frog, Texas, be with the family, Gabriel Windsor, as they continue to process what's taking place and work for healing and work for justice. Lord, listen to our hearts. May we be attuned to you. May we hear the gospel, even the parts of the gospel we don't want to hear. May we hear them afresh, because you're with us. Now may we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, the Lord's Prayer. Together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. It is not the temptation, but deliver us from evil. Divide us the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's now time for our offertory prayer. And this is the time when we normally have the plates and we bring them out.
So I'll still bring them out and share them with you. This would be a good time for you to prepare your offering and prepare your hearts for giving to the Lord and the ministries that we have here. Let me pray. Holy God, we marvel at your love for your creation. When Jesus saw the crowds that gathered, he had compassion on them. And his ministry and the church that hears his name must always remember we were born out of compassion. We offer our gifts to continue the work of compassion. But more than this, we offer ourselves as he also commanded us to go in his holy name. We pray. Amen. As we transition into a time of music and praise, I invite you to, no matter where you are, stand and sing aloud. Sing a joyous song to the Lord. No judgment. Release it to him. Our first hymn this morning is going to be 445, Happy the Home When God is There. And we will sing all four verses. Please join us.
morning's anthem is On Eagle's Wings, a beautiful arrangement by Mark Hayes, sung by myself and Aaron. Bible. And 
and there they are. So it, it's, it's really metaphorical because they're like right in the middle of our life. They're, they're really full of the whole range of emotions from the, the most sorrowful to the most praising. Uh, whatever deaths you may be experiencing right now, you could probably find an answer to your heart's desires in reading the Psalms. And some of them are long and some of them are short. Some of them are kind of angry. Some of them are sad. And usually, though, there is a conclusion to them that leaves you in a better place than when you started. And the 23rd Psalm is only six verses long, and so we took one verse a week for the last six weeks and really worked on those. And I thank you for, for following along, and I hope you've memorized the 23rd Psalm in the process because it has so many good things to offer to you. And it wraps up with this verse, that you shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Contemplate that and realize the universal need that's there. Because all of us, all of us seek to have a place. Each one of us needs to have a place, a place that we can call home. And we seem to be going through life trying to find that place really feel, feels a universal need. Derry, Derry and I this week celebrated our wedding anniversary. It's 37 years. We're so, so grateful for each other and for God bringing us together. Uh, when, we were, when we first got married, Derry was still a senior in college at Texas Tech, like 350 miles away. Well, what happened is uh, we had a lot of arrangements to make, and she was busy with her mom over the phone making plans for the wedding. That she needed me to find a place to live. Now, a word of advice to young couples getting married from one's in college and one other one's back there, don't leave it up to the husband to find the apartment. The first part, spend some time together to actually do this. But she trusted me, whether that was a good idea or not, to find us an apartment. And so I just started a new job at a small news network that was kind of in the northwest section of Dallas, kind of an industrial section. I had to be at work at 4.30 in the morning each day. And so I thought, what I want to do is find a place that's really close to work. Well, it was kind of a rough neighborhood, first of all, but, but also I wanted to find a place that was really cheap. Well, that made it even rougher. So I found this one-bedroom apartment for the bargain price of $275 a month. I said, that's the apartment for us, our, our, our honeymoon place to start our life together. So I got this apartment, and Jerry said, oh, okay, well, I'll take a look at it. We'll see. So we went in, so I, I signed the paperwork ahead of time. That was our, our first place to live. Well, it was kind of nice in March and April when I was looking at it as far as the, the temperature, but by June, we realized the air conditioning did not work in our new apartment. <laughs> not only did it not work, but we also had a, a significant problem with roaches in the place. So we had roaches, we had no air conditioning. We opened the windows up to get some air. We realized that the neighbors looking below us loved to cook with curry. And so the curry, the smell of curry kind of wafted up into our apartment all the time. So roaches, curry, no air conditioning. We, we decided what we should do is go for a walk. And so we would regularly go for a walk. We'd take walks in the neighborhood. And nearby there was, was a, a very nice uh, middle income neighborhood of, of houses. And we used to dream that someday, someday we'll have a house in which to dwell. Someday we could have a house. And so we were, we'd walk through there, but at the time, interest rates were like 12% or even higher to get a mortgage. It was just hardly possible at all for a young couple to be able to take out a mortgage and get a home. But we kept dreaming and kept thinking there's going to be a day where we can afford to get a home. And sure enough, within a couple of years, we were able to save enough money for a down payment. Our interest rates had come down a little bit. We got some, some bond money. We were able to get a home. And it was a joy to get that along the way to dream. But I gotta tell you, even with the house, we realized it didn't come headache free. There's gonna be things like fire ants in the backyard to take care of, weeds to work on, fences to fix. There was foundations to repair. And then children came and you had to child proof the house and you had to repaint and redo some things and, and, and really work on your home on a regular basis. So the, the home was, was not going to be headache free, but we thought it's, it's our forever place. We'll be here for a long time. And we kind of, uh, to the amazement of our realtor, 
kept that house for, for a lot longer than most young couples do. We, we continue to keep it. And in fact, our kids grew up and they actually uh, moved away uh, off to college or off to their own apartment. And, and they, we were sort of empty nesters at that point with this home. We thought we'd stay there for the rest of our lives. But three years ago, I was appointed to come be your pastor here in Terrell. And so we, we, we literally flew the coop. We, we left the nest and we came here to be with you all. I'm so grateful to be here. After a while, my, my youngest son moved back in, and, and he's there now with his wife. They recently married two years ago, and, and now they're expecting their first child, our first grandchild, next month. And so we're very excited for Austin and Sarah to be back in that home. So that home has been in our family now for 35 years, which sounds like a really long time. And there have been headaches with it. They continued to put a roof on just last month. But... There will always be some headaches taking care of our homes, won't they? Always be some things that you've got to, to restore or fix or worry about. Even if you pay off the mortgage, you have to think about things like taxes, insurance, maintenance, utilities, things that go on. And so when we read this passage about dwell in the house of the Lord forever, we, we think we're, we're moving from the, the temporary nature of our homes here to the permanent nature of the home in which God is calling us to. The temporary things that come with the headaches and the problems and the permanent nature of the eternal dwelling place that God has for us. You know, 35 years is a long time for us to have that house, but eventually it will no longer be our home. Eventually we won't have that home anymore. So in, in a way, things are temporary. And it, it sort of reminds me of the story in Exodus of the temporary nature of the temple that they had. The Hebrew people, God instructed them to build a tabernacle. The tabernacle was to be a tent, a tent where they would come together and meet God. And the work on the tabernacle was very involved. The, the tent had certain poles and certain types of wood and certain fabric for it. And the, the tabernacle would house the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the very presence of God in their lives. And it was a lot of work. The people realized also it was a temporary nature. It was a tent that would be there just temporarily, then it would be taken up when it was time to move. They moved to a new location. And so their dwelling place would change. Maybe your dwelling place has changed quite a few times. But God's presence is with you always, even in the temporary nature. So the Hebrew people then eventually came to the promised land, and there King Solomon built their first temple. And as they had that temple, they thought, this is it, we'll be here forever. Yet then the Babylonians came and wiped them out and destroyed the temple. Many years later, during Jesus' time, King Herod had been back in, 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 in power, and he had helped restore their fortunes and rebuilt the temple. But yet the Romans would destroy that temple as well. And so you see, even things that we think are going to last forever, quite often, are temporary in nature. But the home that God prepares for us, that home is a permanent home. You know, this 23rd Psalm we've been studying for six weeks is something that I read often at funerals. And it's paired often with the Gospel account, Gospel of John, the Gospel of John chapter 14, in which Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. You know, it's good to see those two paired together because this 23rd Psalm and the John 14 passage combine to remind us that we have a permanent dwelling place, a permanent dwelling place with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who's prepared a place for you. You have a place. And that's so significant. So significant. But what do we do in this temporary place? What do we do in this tent? The tent and where we're being kept right now. What is God calling us to do? Well, I believe we're not just sitting around twiddling our thumbs. We're not just here to say in the sweet by and by we'll eventually be in heaven. 
I believe God is calling us, the God who loves us, to not only see the future kingdom, but to help bring the present kingdom to this earth. I believe he has work for you and me to do now. And that's why I'm so glad to see this church so involved in missions. I'm so glad to see your commitment to Burnett Early Childhood Center, that you want to help those children get a better start. And I want you to know that God has work for you to do, even right now in the quarantine, even though we're not worshiping together, there is work in this church for you to do. There are ways you can support the ministry and the outreach and make a difference. I want to share with you that we have a new, a new Methodist Day School director, one that you've met before because she's spoken from this pulpit because she was a teacher here first for, for two years. And her name is Michelle Madden, a very faithful child of God who loves taking care of children and helping them grow. And she's going to be going to be our new director starting next fall. And Michelle called me the other day, and I want to share with you the concern that she had. And that is that there is a, there is a family who's been greatly affected by the COVID-19 virus, as well as the economic downturn. And they really want to keep their little girl in Methodist Day School for next year. But they're not, even both the parents working, they're not going to be able to afford it. And it looks like they're, they can afford something, but they can't afford the full tuition. They're going to be about $135 a month short. And so Michelle called me and said, would there be somebody in the church who could help close that gap? Somebody here who could help make it possible for this little girl to be able to go to kindergarten at the Methodist Day School? Well, folks, I've been your pastor for three years, and the first thing I can say is we have an amazing Methodist Day School. We have a school that really gives kids that foundation. You know, there's a, a, a book called Everything I Really Needed to Learn. I learned in kindergarten. You may have heard of that. This kindergarten gives those kids the foundation that they need. It gives those children the spiritual as well as the, the, the physical, as well as the mental, the emotional, psychological bringing. That they know who they are and they know whose they are. And I just, I can tell you by being around those kids and seeing the joy that's in their hearts that are at this day school pre-K 3, pre-K 4, and kindergarten. It's life-changing. It's foundational. And so I also know you, the people of this community, and I know that you've seen the good things Methodist Day School has done. So if you're capable of giving that 135 per month, at least for September, maybe October, would you please email or text me or private message me? I'd like to connect with you so we can make it possible we can get this little girl in kindergarten. You see, what that's doing is that's bringing a glimpse of the kingdom of God. That temporary nature that we're in, that tent that we're in, it's, it's allowing us to see the presence of God. You see, what happened with the Hebrew people is they didn't just have their church outside of the camp. They didn't say, well, it's going to be over here. When we get around to it, we'll go to church. You see, it wasn't that way because the tent... The tabernacle that they had was placed right in the middle of their camp. You might say the tabernacle was the first thing that they built, was the presence of God, the church there, the first thing they established, a place for God to dwell. And everything they did, even just doing things to market or going places, everything they did revolved around, oriented around the presence of God in their lives. That was the key. That was the, the center of their lives. I wonder if we've gotten away from that, where it's no longer the center of our lives. And so my hope is that helping out Burnett, helping out this little girl at this day school, things we can do like that, or examples of putting church first, putting God first, right in the middle of our camp. That's the most important thing, to do that first. You know, last week we had we had Ethel Livingston here. She went right across the way from me. She goes by the nickname Cupcake. Cupcake. We had a dialogue that I hope was very helpful. Cupcake is is black, and she's lived in Carroll all of her seventy years. 
We were dealing with that verse 5 about things that trouble us, what troubles you. And I hope that was helpful for you to listen and to learn about things that trouble, particularly people in the black community. It, it, it dawned on me in, in reflecting on this verse, verse 6 of the 23rd Psalm that black people, white people, Hispanic people, Asian people, wherever you are, what, you, what you're looking for is the same thing. We're looking for a place to dwell. We're looking for a place to dwell with God, to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's what Cupcake is seeking. That's what I'm seeking. That's probably what you're seeking. Ultimately, you're seeking a dwelling place. It's not just about a physical structure. You see, it was really a tent that they had in the Hebrew time. It's really about the presence of God in your midst. So I want to ask you, when we're working through this COVID virus, when we're working through the economic challenges taking place in our times right now, when we're working through the Black Lives Matter and ways to work with each other and see each other, are you working with them with your eyes fixed on the challenges and the problems of your earthly tent? Or are you working then with your eyes fixed on Jesus and our heavenly home? Because it's coming, folks. Our heavenly home, our heavenly dwelling place is coming. And we are not called to sit around idly and to say, well, that'll be then. We are called to pick up the tools that God has given us. To pick up the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Those fruit of the Spirit, we're called to take those right now and work with our own hands to help usher in the kingdom of God in our midst. And we pray. Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters connecting right now and watching. Lord, I thank you for the message about our dwelling place, that you, Lord, have given us not just a temporary home, but an eternal home in Jesus Christ. And dear God, while we deal with the challenges of our earthly homes, not just the ones with bricks and mortar, but our earthly home and the community in which we live, it's easy to get frustrated it's easy to get disappointed at the challenges we have here, but those distractions take our eyes off the ultimate goal, the goal of living with you and living in community in our dwelling place in eternity. And you walk, watch with us, watch with us, walk with us, guide us, and help us to be the kingdom-building people you have challenged and called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. We prepare for our choral benediction. I just want to share our benediction for this day. That is to take a breath. I want you just to take a breath and realize that no matter the circumstances you're facing right now, at this present moment, there is kingdom building work, kingdom building work to be done. And God is putting you and me to work. So keep your eyes on Jesus, and by the grace and love of God, you and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See you next week.